Good morning, church. Hey, I'm Pastor Rebecca, and I am thrilled to welcome you to our family service. Our family services are our favorite services of the year because it means we get to receive from all of the fabulous kids uh, in our church. So you're going to see teenagers leading the worship this morning. You're going to see middle schoolers doing the announcements. You're going to see testimonies during the message time from high schoolers, kids in every which place. And so I just want to invite you to kind of enjoy the experience and to receive uh, from our kids. Let's open the service in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to love you. God, we thank you for everything that you have poured out upon us. And Jesus, as we go into a time of worship, I just ask that you would receive our praises, that you would feel the love that we attempt to pour back at you. But Father, come, inhabit the praises of your people, the speaking of the word, the breaking of bread. We just thank you for everything you do and everything you are. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to stand and worship if you're able.
we're going to stay in an attitude of worship. And we're going to um, take communion together. I think this morning's communion feels especially poignant. And you can stay standing because we're going to go back into worship. But because any time we have our kids and our adults together, it feels like family. And communion something that should be taken as a church family, as a family of God. So uh, Tommy's going to start us off. The Lord, Jesus, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread and eat together. After supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is new convenient in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup and drink. And whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death, burial, resurrection, and new life of Jesus until he comes. Let's continue in worship.
You can find an announcement card, an announcement sheet on your seat along with a communication card that can be used to update your information, sign up for activities, and more. For those watching online, the communication and announcement card links can be found in the description on YouTube. If you're a first-time visitor, we welcome you to CTK, and we have a gift for you. Just take the communication card you filled out to the welcome sender after the service. Help us, Barusa, up the outside of CTK Vineyard. Um, on Saturday, June 11th, from 9 a.m. until 12 p.m., we will be spring cleaning, including cleaning up beds and doing other work outside. Use the communication card to let us know how you can help. Welcome to CTK, the event, will be on Sunday, June 12th, after the service. This is a new date. Find out more about the church and how to become a member. Child care and lunch will be provided. Free food, y'all. <laughs> there will be a congregational meeting on Sunday, June 5th, after the service. Hear about the future plans for the church. Members will be affirmed the 2022-23 budget. Lunch and child care will be provided. All right, thank you, you guys. How's everybody doing? 
good. All right. So I have some special friends up here to help me set things up real quick. Um, if you guys just want to lay it down right here. And I'd love to invite all the kids right back up to sit right here in front so they can see what we're doing. As big as you can make it. Perfect. And then you can just put the table right here. Sorry, I don't know how much of a mess I'm going to make, so I'm trying to be nice and prepared. Oh, yeah, you guys can sit down on the ground, not on the risers. Yeah, you guys got to be able to see me. All right. Okay. Gary, if you could throw my slide up there, that would be awesome. So I have this verse for you guys. Do you guys want to read it with me or should I just read it? You'll read it with me. Awesome. Okay, so it's Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. Um, do you guys know what the Holy Spirit is? Hit me with it, man. That's exactly right. The Holy Spirit gives you strength and boldness. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit. Do you guys know the awesome things that God has done for you? Yeah? Hit me with them. Go ahead. love that. That's awesome. So one of the really cool things is he sent his only son, Jesus, to die for you guys, um, which is a super huge and awesome thing. And it can be really scary to tell the world about that, right? Because it's such a huge thing and it's so cool and it can be scary to share that. So I have a fun little object lesson to show you guys. So I have some hydrogen peroxide that I'm going to mix do you think anything's going to happen when I pour this in here? No. Okay, let's see. Nothing really happened yet, right? And then I have some dish soap. Do you think anything's going to happen when I mix this? Yeah? Okay, watch really, really closely. Yeah. Do you guys see anything? happening? Yeah, there's a little something happening, but not very much. So sometimes when we try to share the good news of Jesus on our own, we don't always know what to say. And sometimes we only kind of sort of get there. But did you know I have some yeast? What do you think is going to happen when I add yeast to this? It's going to explode. Hopefully it doesn't explode, explode. That would be no good. You hope it explodes. All right, hang on. Let me mix it in here real quick. So you guys think it's going to do something really cool? All right, here's hoping. It worked last night when I tried it, so let's, fingers crossed it works again, you guys. All right, got to get it all nice and mixed up. All right, so you guys are thinking it's going to do something cool? Okay, ready? Can you, can you guys all see it? All right, watch really, really closely. Whoa! It's still going. Pretty cool. It didn't shoot up the way it did last night, but that's okay. It still looks pretty cool. So that was pretty crazy, right, the way it all reacted. So the way all of those things reacted together, that's exactly what happens when you ask for the power of the Holy Spirit, when you ask God for the Holy Spirit in your life. With all the things that you have, all your boldness and knowing the good news of Jesus, you can kind of do things, but when you invite the Holy Spirit into your life, he gives you strength and guidance and boldness to share the good news of God with everyone. Um, 
Would any of you guys like to come up and pray for us? Harper, you want to come on up real quick? All right, you can come stand right over here. Go ahead, bud. Dear God, please help us all keep safe and, and help us and, and guide us so we know what we're doing and help us if we need you and everything that's all about you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You guys can go sit back with your parents. It's always a good day in church when you get to make um, giant messes on the platform. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Gabe. Birthday, Gabe. Can we give another round of applause for our kids? They are awesome. All right. Hey, can we, um, we're just going to pray, and we're going to launch into the message this morning. Good? Um, there's a couple uh, extra things we're going to add into our prayers this morning. Um, Judy Mensch, a longtime member of Christ the King, has been moved into hospice this week. And um, Scott Nichols' dad is very, very ill, and so Scott's with him kind of in his last um, time here on earth. And so... Um, I think our family service helps us to remember that this isn't just a place we come, but it's a family we're a part of. And so when people in our family are hurting, then we hurt with them. Um, so let's just come to Jesus. Jesus, we come to you as beloved children, as brothers and sisters, as people um, who have been called by you and brought into your family and into the family of Christ the King Vineyard. And Lord, we pray especially for those in our midst who are hurting. God, we pray for the Mensch family. We pray for the Nichols family. Um, we just pray that the peace of Jesus would be with them, that the comfort of the Holy Spirit would be close by. And Father, we thank you for the kids that you've brought here, the, the young people you've brought here, the older folks, the middle folks. Jesus, we thank you that you don't call us as adults, but you call us as family all together. And we just ask that you would bless uh, the pre speaking of the, your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I did the most typical Ohio thing ever this weekend. What's everybody doing this weekend? Mulching. Oh, I haven't even gotten that far, Jane. I went to the garden center. Me and all of Cleveland were at the garden center. And it used to be we had this like little garden center that nobody knew existed. And so we could get like all the good plants for super cheap. But then apparently a lot of other cheap people like us figured it out. So we went and it was like swarming. And there was like, so my husband and I bought this house like 10 years ago. This old 100-year-old Lakewood house. It's got these really great flower beds because the people before us were good gardeners. And so we have felt in the last 10 years like we need to like keep it up. So there we are at the garden center with our four massive carts of like flats and herbs and bushes and perennials because we're really trying to not spend money every year, but we're failing. Uh, and then like there's this guy who's like maybe early 60s with like two little basil plants behind me in line. And he looked at my giant spread and he looked at his and he said, I think we're in different phases of life. <laughs> and I was like, you are correct. Uh, the reason why we are doing so much vegetable gardening, however, is because there was a tragedy in our backyard this spring. Yes, in February, we were on it. We were gardener extraordinaires. My husband thoughtfully bought seed packets. I got flats. We planted seeds with our kids. It was precious. And we nurtured these stupid things for months. 
We had, because they kept outgrowing things, so we'd put them in bigger things, and then we'd have, oh, then there'd be soil in the dining room, and I'd be sweeping up the soil. And so we ran out of space. We'd have home group at our house, and there was nowhere to put the food because the dining room table was taken over and the buffet was taken over because we didn't think when we bought the packet of seeds, it's a lot of seeds and therefore a lot of plants. So then the top of the dog cage was taken over, and so we're kind of balancing, and every time the dog goes in her cage, we're like, no, no, go with the plants, right? For months, we went on vacation, and we had my sister spritz the plant babies for a week. And then a couple weeks ago, my husband, smart man that he is, realized they needed to go into the ground. So these seeds and sprouts that we had carefully, thoughtfully, lovingly nurtured for months, he put into the ground. But there's this thing in marriage called communication. And I don't know if any of you guys have struggled with this, but we like each other so much, but we don't always talk to each other. You know? Like when we talk to each other, we're like business meeting or like, I love you, I love you, I love you, right? But there's not like a lot of communication that's practical. So he puts the plants in the ground and I, I am under the impression, I could be wrong, that he was hoping I would water them. I was under the impression that he who planted them had watered them. Do you know who watered them? No one? They all died. Every last one, they died. All of my plants, these children, the plant children, it was very tragic. I was going to name them, and I'm like so glad I didn't because it's less morbid now. You know what I mean? We're not being like, little Timmy died in the backyard. We're just like, the tomatoes, they went. Um, but anyways, I, I was thinking about that this week as we we're coming into our family service because as parents, we are forever planting seeds of faith in our kids, aren't we? Right? I mean, it says in the Old Testament, it talks about how that you should be... Um, you know, sharing the word with your children as you walk down the road, right? As you sit down, as you lie down. As parents, we're always trying to plant these seeds of the gospel in our kid's life. But one of the things about parenting is you can't just plant it and leave it. You can't even just plant it, nurture it, let it grow, and leave it, right? Right? It is a perpetual watering. It's a perpetual nurturing. And I think that's one of the reasons why church and church family is so essential in the life of our kids and our young people. Because it's not just parents who are called to water the seeds of faith. It's everybody. It's all of us. That when we invite our kids up here, what we're communicating to them is, you are important in the kingdom of God. That you don't have to wait until you're older to matter to Jesus. And you matter to us. And so no matter what happens when they graduate from high school, when they leave their parents' houses, if nothing else about church, they will remember that church is the place where the people really love them a lot. And when they come to a time in their life where they really need some love and they really need some support, maybe they'll remember us. Maybe they'll remember that Sunday in May when they came up front because they felt brave and we all clapped at them. And after the service, we made a point to tell all these young people what a great job they did. Maybe they'll remember that. And maybe that remembrance will be the thing that brings them back to Jesus in a time where they really need him. Last week we talked um, about the Holy Spirit and about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to touch on that a little bit this morning. But we only um, read the first part of Acts 2.17. So today we're going to take a look at the full text. It is there, slowly appearing on the screen. Acts 2.17. In the last days, God says... I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Now what that says to me 
is just what it says. The Holy Spirit is poured out on all people. The Holy Spirit is poured out on our toddlers. The Holy Spirit is poured out on our preschoolers, on our elementary age kids, on our teenagers, on our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you get the point. At every age, it is the will of the Holy Spirit to touch and to fill and to empower. Not just to be a good person, not just to live a good life, but to use the gifts that God has placed inside of us for bigger impact. This morning, um, we got a chance to receive from kids. And I think it's interesting because here it says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And so I think that this is just kind of painting a picture of what the church should be. The church should be valuing the contributions of our kids and of our most senior saints. That we shouldn't be writing people off as too old to do something major for God or too young. I was talking to somebody a couple weeks ago and they're like, well, you know, they weren't from the church, so don't feel weird. Uh, and they were like, like 65. They're like, well, you know, I mean, I did the thing, you know, in my day, you know. I mean, I did this and did this for God and I did this. So, you know, I mean, someone else's turn, you know. I'm like, you're 65. That's it. Or is this when we like, God doesn't use people over the age of 65, but in our culture, in this glorification of young people, there is not a lot of uh, value spoken about the intense importance of our oldest generation. And I think that like young people are too young, older folks are too old, and like what is there, like a sweet spot? right between like 25 and about 45, that's really where you, where you land. But that's not Jesus. That's not the will of God, and that's not the church. The church is a picture of the Spirit of God being poured out on all people. Older men, women, having dreams and visions, and mentoring, and having ideas, and thoughts, and wisdom that they're pouring down to the younger people, younger people, prophesying, using the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and being believed that their gifts are really from Jesus, not having their heads padded, right? This is the picture of the church, and this is the picture of this morning. So this morning, we have a special treat. Three of our um, high school seniors are going to come up, and instead of just hearing from me or from Pastor Dwight or whoever, they're going to share part of the word this morning. They're going to share their God story, and so as they do, I just want to encourage us as a church to ask Jesus, what do you want me to receive from them this morning? Because we believe that God has put a gift in each of these folks, and that gift is for us. So we'll let them start off. Good morning, everyone. So for those of you who don't know me, I feel like everyone here has seen me a million times up on the stage, but I will introduce myself. My name is Kenzie Molnar. I do K through five large group with a bunch of your kids, so I know like all of the kiddos in this room. So here's my testimony. So I was raised in the church. You know, I went to church every Sunday. I did youth groups, vacation Bible school, and you know, did Bible studies with my family. My parents were involved in the church. My father would teach kindergarten through first grade. And one day when I was in sixth grade, I was sitting in my classroom and I thought, you know what, I really wanna go and help. So I just asked him. So I went into his K through one room and I went down to what used to be called Treehouse. Raise your hand if you were here when our youth center was called Treehouse. You're like an OG if you were here from that time. (laughs) 
So I absolutely fell in love with teaching the kids. Seeing the excitement on their faces when they were learning about Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit was like the favorite part of my week. So when it came down to choosing a spot for when I was going to do my kids' ministry, I absolutely chose teaching, and I love every moment. So after a couple years, I finally got into the groove of life with God. You know, I went to school, home, church, hung out with friends, family, repeat. It's kind of just like a never-ending cycle. Then my grandma died. Now, although a close family friend had died a couple years prior, I say that this is probably the first time I ever actually had to really deal with a death in my family. Now, for some background, I suffer from high-functioning anxiety. Now, I didn't know this at the time when I was in, like, eighth grade because I just got diagnosed um, a couple of months ago. But let me give you a quick little simple definition of what that means. It basically means you push your anxieties and your emotions down in, and you kind of save them for later, so then you can move throughout your day like it's all normal. And then, you know, obviously later, it all builds up, it builds up, and then you just kind of sprout out with like all of your emotions and anxieties at once. Kind of like a little breakdown. I don't know how many of you do that. I do that all the time. So when my grandma died, I pushed the grief and pain down because I didn't really want to have to deal with it at that time. And I couldn't give it to God because I didn't know how to, and I didn't want to have to feel that pain in order to give it to him. Luckily, when I teach down in the youth center, it gives me the opportunity to further my own faith. You see, I learn best when I'm able to teach something to someone else. So like in math class, if I'm having trouble understanding a concept, I go to my friend and I say, hey, can I explain this to you really quick? Because maybe if I can explain it out loud to you, it'll like make sense in my brain. If you have trouble learning stuff, try it. It's a really great thing to do. So one day we had a lesson down in Treehouse and it was a lesson about putting your trust in God and giving every part to him. We tell our kids that all the time. But sometimes we really have to think about, are we doing that ourselves? In that moment, I realized something. I wasn't giving God access to my emotions, anxiety, and pain. I was giving him all of the surface level things. And I wasn't really giving him my heart. So I prayed. I began to develop a relationship with God and show him all the stuff that was beneath my surface of high-functioning anxiety. Don't be fooled, though. This did not happen overnight. It took a lot of prayer and a lot of talking with elders and just mentors and stuff like that. And just when I thought I was getting a handle on everything and I was really developing something with God, my aunt died. Now there's a common theme in death here and my explanation for that is because death is a hard thing to process just by itself and then on top of it when you don't have God there with you, it's even harder. And with my high functioning anxiety, death and pain are like the two hardest things for me to deal with because that's a lot of emotions all at once. So. My aunt's death hit me harder than my grandma's because she was young and had three beautiful children that she was leaving behind. And when I heard she died, the first thing I asked myself was two things. How could God possibly think it was in my cousin's plan that their mother would die when they were so young? And two, how is that fair? Those are the kind of questions that could have turned me away from faith. However, a few weeks later, I was given an answer to those questions. Steve actually started a new lesson in our youth group that month entitled, Where is God in All the Suffering? God knew I had questions, and he answered them in a very straightforward way. It's kind of funny how he does that. It's like sometimes you have this question, and you're going through like a crisis of faith, and he just like smacks you in the face with the answer, and is like, this is the answer to that question that you had. He again showed me how to put my whole trust and faith into him, and I ha I'm happy to say that I now have a deep relationship with him. Not only did God show me how to give every bit of myself to him, but God also showed me my passion in life, teaching. I'm grateful for that because I'm now going to college to become a high school science teacher, and I couldn't be more excited. I don't know if I would have ever found that passion without my first day of youth ministry, so I wanted to end my testimony by thanking God and by thanking everyone here for that. Thank you. All right, how's it going, guys? I'm Peyton, if you don't know me. I help with the kids downstairs. And so I always kind of grew up in the church. Like, I've always been surrounded by the church. My grandpa was, is, is still a Southern Baptist pastor. I grew up in a Baptist church. And I was like, 
I don't think I, I think a lot of people like didn't really like me at my church because I was like a little kid, you know, with hyperactivity and my best friend at that church also had hyperactivity. So like two little hyperactive kids running around a small Baptist church, it wasn't the best look at a lot of times because it was just like, we're, we're like a, two Tasmanian devils running to that church. But we ended up coming to this church when I was like in third grade. And like the first time I remember God or like my, like a, talking to God, praying, it was, we, I always liked setting a tent up in the backyard and camping in the backyard. But my, I don't think my dad liked it very much because like, it was like a lot of work to put it up and take it down. And I remember we woke up in the morning. It was real cloudy outside. My dad was like, all right, we got to take the tent down now because it's going to rain. But I wanted to keep the tent up. So he was like, look at the radar. Look at this giant rain cloud that's coming in. And I was like, oh. so I prayed to God. And I was like, God, please don't let this rain come because I want to keep this tent up. But we took, took down the tent anyways, and the rain never came. But at that moment, I was like, that was God. And I think it may have just been my dad pointing to like a random place and saying, this is the rain that's coming for us. And I don't think there ever was any rain, but I like to think that there was some rain. But I always, when growing up, I always, I was just, I did what I was supposed to. I never, I said I love God, but I never was, really had a deep connection with him. I just did what I was supposed to. I went to church. I pretty much did what I was told. I did what I thought I should do, but never really developed a relationship with God. I just said I loved him. And I was in middle school, like eighth grade, all throughout middle school. Steve was like, when you're in high school, you're in help out with the kids, right? And I was like, yeah, sure. And then that's what happened. He kept on persisting. You're in help out with the kids when you, you're a freshman. Yeah, sure. And like, I didn't want to say no, but I wanted to say no, but I didn't want to tell him to say I wanted to say no. So I just did it anyways. So then I did it and I actually liked it a lot more than I thought I would. And if he never pushed me to help out with the kids, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today because just those kids' lessons, it made me help it understand it better because, like, the kids' lessons, they're all kind of dumbed down. Like, they're for the little kids. And I like that a lot better, honestly. Because sometimes when, like, the pastor's preaching, you know, it's like he gives you this broad idea of what you should take away from it. But the kids, it's like, this is what you should take away from it. And I like that because it's like, this is, like, what this story means. So... I started like really growing in my faith once I started helping out with the kids, but it was one of those things where because I grew up in the church, I never had that moment that was like, this is where my relationship with God began. This exact moment, this big thing happened because I've heard a lot of testimonies where people are like, this is what made me start believing in God. This is what made me love God. I never really had that. So it kind of frustrated me sometimes. So I was like, God, like, you're not really doing, there's, you're not really giving me this thing that proves that you're there and that you care about me. But then Steve said something to me. It was um, last, it was uh, a couple months ago when we were at Vineyard United. He said, I feel like God keeps you in his hands right here at all times. Like he's cupped, he's always there. You're like cupped in his hands. And that really spoke to me because then I realized then and there God never really gave me that moment because he was always giving me that moment because he gave me this amazing family. He gave me amazing friends because with high school, I probably, if I didn't make the friends I have now, I have really close, tight-knit friends that are a real gift and they're almost like a family to me because I've seen in high school like making the wrong friends will, friends will send you down the wrong path and I picked like the perfect friends and my, my parents have been so supportive throughout the years and I was given such an amazing life, and I realized I was, it, there wasn't a time where God was like, this, this is like, I don't have that exact moment because my entire life is that moment. So, yeah, that's pretty much all I got to say. You go. Thank you, Peyton. Thank you, wonderful. Kenzie, Peyton, thank you. Uh, my name is Wyatt. I've been coming here for, I don't know, seven months, six months or so. Um, and I never really grew up in the church. I started off being baptized when I was like three. It was a Catholic baptism. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what it was. I never learned what God really is. 
until about five years ago, I actually, you know, I had that moment where I, I met God. And leading up to that, I had gone to church like here and there, you know, you get stuck with your grandparents for the weekend, they drag you out to church, they dress you up in pretty clothes, and you groan, and you moan, and you sing all the songs, and you didn't understand. And then I got older, and I moved into Olmsted Falls. I met a few friends in fifth grade. Two years later, one of them come up, comes up to me, and he's like, hey, why don't you come to church with me sometime? So I was like, sure, why not? I'll try it. So I talk to my grandma, and I tell her, hey, Trevor invited me to church. Let's go to church. I don't know what it's about, but let's do it. Um, so I went, and from the moment I walked in there, I felt extremely welcome. I felt understood, and I felt loved, and they included me in everything. They, they taught me. They, um, they brought me into the youth group. I met many others like me, and I've seen the way that God has worked through all of them. He has shown himself through the people in my life. He's been there for me, giving me people in my life that I love so dearly. And eventually, a few years after, I started to fall off a bit. I I, want, I once had a spot in my room dedicated to just sitting in the dark and praying. And then I got a bunch of clutter in there, and I stopped. I stopped doing that. I didn't go to church as often, and I really fell short. I felt like God wasn't there for me anymore because my prayers weren't answered. But eventually, I realized that they were answered in much different ways that I I see now, but I could not see at the time. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, I went back, and it was, it was good for the time because it was during COVID, and we all know how that went. Um, and they asked me, they were moving at the time. This is Trinity Church on Lorraine. They moved out to Lindbergh in Olmsted Falls. And they, they had me help with all the other youth. They, they emailed me. They're like, hey, Wyatt, we really want you back. We need your help. Um, and so I went, and it felt good to help. It felt good to be there with the Lord. And eventually, through COVID, once again, um, I fell short. And I'm safe to say that that will most definitely be the last time because from fall of 2020 to spring of 2021 was probably the darkest moment in my life. I did many things that a kid my age should not have done. I was rebellious. I was angry. I was, I felt unappreciated and I felt like no one was there for me anymore until I gave up, and I was like, all right, God, I'm at my wit's end. What do you want me to do? And sure enough, it was right at the beginning of April. I think that's March. Yeah, March. And um, my buddy Trevor, he texts me, and he's like, hey, why don't, you come, why don't you come to Easter service? I think it'll be good for you. And from there on, I've been dedicated to the church. Um, I've met wonderful, wonderful people, um, especially uh, Lydia. She's helped me as well as her family. And I, I can't move past that. They've been such a wonderful group in my life, as well as my grandmother. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> It's, it's, been, it's been a good journey so far. I mean, last two weeks ago, I got baptized right there. <laughs> um, I've joined the worship team, as you all saw. <laughs> um, and it's been, it's, it's been good. It's, I mean, God has done wonderful miracles for me. I, I ask him 
for everything. I go to him. I thank him for everything at first. It's always God first. I thank him first. Like yesterday was my last day at work. I got no gas in the car. Some guy comes through my line and he gives me a $20 tip. And I say, thank you, God. This is what I needed. And now I got gas in the car, so we're good. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... I think that's all my notes. <laughs> kind of just, yeah, went along with it. Thank you. That's my story. Good job. Thanks, guys. Oh, my gosh. I wasn't expecting to tear up in church this morning. Wow. I'm just thinking about I'm just thinking about the things that only Jesus can do. And I'm just thinking about all that watering and all of that nurturing that each of these people spoke about and all these people who believed in them and all these people who stepped out and invited them and the people who took a chance on them and I was just thinking Jesus let me always be that person. And let all us always be those people. Let us always be those people who notice a kid, even if it's a kid who is a hyperactive, ch -ch 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 -ch, because let us always remember that that kid could be a Peyton. And then when we see a kid walk in, maybe at their worst and having a hard time, let us always remember that that could be a Wyatt. And when we see a kid who just might be squiggling in Sunday school and needs a mission and needs someone to believe that they can do big things, let us always remember that that can be a Mackenzie. Because there's Peytons and Mackenzies and Wyatts in this church who are little. And they're watching these people. When I was little, I was in Sunday school and I thought the Christian faith looked super cool because Don Molnar was my teacher. And I wanted to grow up and be like Don Molnar. And I just think about that. I think about how many kids are here in our church who need to look up and say, I want to be cool like Mr. Leo, who always smiles at me in church. I want to be fun like Mr. Scott, who plays Uno Attack. Right? I want to play the bongos like Mr. Dave. And I just think that we always have to be mindful of the fact that there is a generation after us and they're watching us. And we don't know who they are, but Jesus does. And he's planted people in their lives strategically. In church, we are those people. 1 Timothy 4.12 says this, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in life, in faith, in purity. And actually, I'm just going to stop there. I'm not going to read the rest of it. Because I just want to say that these young people this morning have set an example for us. And there's two parts of setting an example. There's the part where you are setting the example, and then there's the people who are supposed to learn from their example. And so to the young people here, to all the kids, to the youth, to all of those folks who bravely came up and danced in front of us and trusted us to smile at them and to clap for them, and they weren't afraid of us, and who were so brave... Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but be an example to the adults in this congregation in speech, in conduct, in faith, in love, in purity. Be an example to us, but for us adults, we need to receive the gift and the anointing that they have, right? We need to receive their courage, their open-heartedness. I mean, like how many of us would come up here and bear our souls, basically, and talk about all the hard things in our life. Yeah, look at all these kids raising their hand. Exactly the point, right? But there's a two-way thing. So this is what we're going to do to close our service. Um, 
Peyton and Mackenzie and Wyatt are, uh, we're going to pray, we're going to close. During ministry time, they're going to pair up with an elder, and they're going to lay hands on people and pray for them. We haven't done this in a really, really long time, but I believe that the Holy Spirit is poured out on all people. Amen? The young and the old. And I believe that our seniors, our high school seniors that were up here, and our kids have a special anointing for us this morning. So if you are feeling like your heart was stirred this morning, and maybe you need to come back to a childlike faith, or maybe some of the things they were talking about, about having that deeper relationship spoke to you, or you just want a touch and a prayer and a blessing from a young person, I want to encourage you to come up and let them lay hands on you and pray for you. They've been given a little crash course in prayer ministry. They're going to be with one of our elders. And I just think this is a wonderful opportunity. So will you stand with me and we'll um, do the benediction. And then we'll invite them and you to come. Uh, And Jeremy, you can come up and do the thing. Jesus, we thank you for this Sunday. We thank you for all the generations that are here. We thank you from, for the oldest saints to the youngest saints. To the babies who are going to grow up to be things that we can't even imagine. And for the people who have stayed faithful for 60 years. And God, we bring us all before you as one church family, and we just say, God, let the anointing of the Holy Spirit rest on us. God, let us learn from each other. Let us become childlike. Let us become courageous like kids. Father, give us a mentoring anointing to be a church that raises up with intention every kid and writes off no one. And God, let that anointing rest on all of us not just the people down in kids' ministry, not just the parents, but God, let us all as a church be those people who water the seeds that the parents have planted. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you with an anointing to be more than you could be on your own. May he keep you in his perfect hand and in his perfect plan. May he make you a blessing to the people you encounter. May he rise up within you giftings that you have never even considered. And may he impact our world through the broken vessels he calls his people. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good Sunday. I invite you to come and be blessed. Early not on my own understanding My life is in the hands of the maker of heaven I lean not on my own understanding Life is in the hands of the maker
Trusting that you'll make something 